Better to get hurt by the truth than comforted by a lie. Isn't that the truth? We all seek the reality of truth. We all do. I mean, that's why we're here. That's why we seek the things that we do. According to legal terms, there is no higher reality than truth. But whose version of truth do you believe? There's a saying that says reality is easy. The deception, that's the hard work. So much about what we read today is set in fiction, literary fiction. Um, even a lot of history is set in historical fiction. And historical fiction is defined by a story with a fictional characters that is set in a real time in history. Now, you can actually have a real person that existed in a real time in history, uh, but had many, uh, how shall we say, fictional uh, characters that would be added to that. The reality of truth. What if I told you that all of us may already know the truth? It's what keeps us up at night. It's sometimes that feeling that, you know, it just doesn't feel right. That could be interpreted as deception. Now, deception is a tool that all Homo sapiens know how to use. Deception is defined as an intentional act in which senders normally transmit messages to foster a false belief or interpretation by the receiver. Now, there's a whole lot of loopholes in this one. In other words, they can actually send you a story that they know is false, but it's going to be up to you by the way that you interpret. The act of causing someone to accept as true or valid what is false or invalid. The act of deceiving, resorting to falsehood and deception. There we go. And so much of our lives today are surrounded by deceptions, falsehoods, very difficult. The internet, if it could be said for one thing, is probably the greatest tool of deception. Hard to determine what is true and what is not. So for this, we got a lot of subject to cover because you're going to be quite surprised as to what this video really is about. But I wanna let you know, we're going by the book so that you can verify everything that is said in this video. The fact is, <clears throat> you and I, people, have no idea what we believe because most of it is wrong, just flat out wrong. And that is the biggest problem in our society today is that we're finding that which is the core of our beliefs, that they're not exactly truth. So we're going to have a little journey in reality, and our next exit is truth. So my question for this video is very serious. Which God, and I'm talking about the God of the Bible, has murdered and killed more homo sapiens, the God of the Bible or Satan? Stop and think about that. Which has caused the death of more human beings, God of the Bible or Satan. It's going to require you to put on your thinking cap because we are going to get deep, folks. If you stay to the end of this video, I will absolutely guarantee you, you are going to be so much more informed than anyone else around in your circle of influence. So you want to make a guess? Hmm? Which one? Give up? Well, the rest of this video is dedicated to bringing the clarity of who is the true murderous God. So, what is so often missed in so many programs is that they do not give you context. They don't give you a historical context. They don't give you the social context or the cultural context of when something was written. So often we accept things that are thousands of years old in a modern vernacular, which is absolutely the opposite of what the writer was intending. So we're going to talk about Satan. 
Ooh, Satan. Oh, Satanists and Luciferians, they don't exist. Anyone who claims that they're a Satanist or a Luciferian or is a fool, because neither one of these exist, and I'm going to show you that they are made up in our mind. So let's continue. In the days of the Old Testament, Satan, with a small s, was a general term for that which was opposed or adverse. It means literally enemy, adversary. The angel of the Lord that stood in the way of Balaam and his donkey is called a Satan against Balaam, Numbers 22, 32. God raised up Hadad of Edom as a Satan against Solomon, 1 Kings 14, 11, 14. God raises up individuals, nations, spiritual entities as Satans numerous times for various adversarial purposes. 1 Samuel 29.4. In this way, Satan, small s, is just a generic term for an adversarial role. You could call those who are your enemies or have something against you or try to harm you, they are Satan. If you are doing it against someone else, you are Satan. To this day, much of Jewish tradition believes Satan to be the evil inclination of humans and having no power except through our evil actions. The book of Job is the first place the word Satan, small s, is used in an actual personified way because this is a parable, and the book of Job is nothing but parables. It never happened. Even Bible theologians cannot tell you where the book of Job fits in the chronology of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament. So, this is used as a parable using the adversarial archetype as a main character, so you can have something to relate to. However, every time this character is mentioned in Job, it appears with the article, the, T-H-E, in front of it, as in the Satan, small s, or literally the adversary, as a generic descriptive term. Although English Bibles capitalize the word Satan, that's wrong. It's a deception. They knew it. In Job, as well as leave the article, the, off, how convenient, it is clear that the Satan, small s, is not meant as a personal name because Hebrew never puts the in front of a personal name, ever. And in the Hebrew text, the appears in front of the word Satan, small s, in Job every time without exception. If you got a Bible that has it with the big S and the V is out, throw it away. It's contaminated. In Hebrew tradition, all things, both evil and good, came from the hand of God. Get this. It's the duality of God. He is both the giver and the destroyer. The Satan, small s, then represents God's destructive agency, a kind of prosecuting attorney appointed by God himself who watched for those who did not obey the law so he could accuse and punish them on God's behalf. Kind of schizophrenic, isn't it? But Kale is the same way with the Hindus. Think about it. So is Allah. In this way, the adversary was not evil per se. He just fulfilled God's destructive will. The Satan, small s, therefore came to be known as the accuser. In those days, the Satan was not the wicked demonic idea of being that which is now. Those conceptual demonic entities were more along the lines of false gods such as Baal and Moloch and other malevolent pagan deities to whom people participated in bizarre rituals and human sacrifice, including Christianity, folks. During all this time, the serpent of Genesis 
was never equated to Satan. In the New Testament, the personification of the Satan as a character is followed. As apocalyptic writings became more popular in the intertestinal period, which they found the Book of Enoch, such as the Book of Enoch, and in this genre of literature, predominantly imagine an archetype enemy and personification of evil. Thus, the generic adversarial title, the Satan, evolved into a personal name, Satan, and came to be seen in a more diabolical sense. So from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we see the Satan conceptually evolved from an adversarial agency of God through which God exercises his destructive will to a demonic enemy of God. Whoa, talk about a promotion. Yes, whom God has come to defeat. This was to solidify the progressive breaking off of this satanic adversarial element from our concept of God. Jesus, not the actual name, again, another great deception. If you want to say Aeus, son of Zeus, that would be proper, was to refine our understanding of God and expose the adversarial destructive agency as opposed to God instead of part of God. For God is the accuser and destroyer of humans, homo sapiens. He is not the father figure and giver of life as portrayed, for he is both the giver and the destroyer. Not until later centuries did Satan become being equated with Lucifer which just means morning star. Now, we're going to get way deep into this. Uh, I'll assure you this. If you stay to the end of this program, again, all your confusion is going to go away. You will understand how this imaginary character called Satan the devil, Lucifer, does not exist. Never has. Well, let's go on. Which means morning star and comes from a prophecy about an earthly king of Babylon in Isaiah 14. And we're going to see how the Christian church has deliberately forged this and known this for well over 1,600 years. Like the unbiblical doctrine of the rapture, which was developed in the 1800s, folks, there is no rapture. If you're hanging your hopes and that, that there's going to be some character in a horse riding in the clouds coming for you, forget it. It ain't ever going to happen because it was made up and was novel enough to become indoctrinated into multitudes within 200 years. See how quickly it went from a concept of some Yahoo, because he was probably depressed, broke, probably was lazy, couldn't work, and now he's turning to his holy book, and now he wants to infect your minds with this idea of a rapture. Yeah. The power of tradition turned Morning Star, the earthly king of Babylon, into Lucifer, a pre-existent spiritual being who wanted to become like God and fail. All myth. You're going to find out here. This is all made up, and they've known it. At some point as time progressed, it just became a fact that Satan was always the fallen angel who rebelled against God in a pre-existent time. We don't even know when that time was. People will often point to Revelation 12, 7 through 9 to defend the idea that Satan was a pre-existent angel who fell. But that scripture has no ties to the Isaiah 14 prophecy about a king of Babylon, nor does it mention any type of fall of a good angel. Rather, it is about the deceiver and accuser being cast down and losing his place of authority. So who is Lucifer? Lucifer makes his appearance in the 14th chapter of the Old Testament book of Isaiah, at the 12th verse, and nowhere else. And here's what it reads. How art thou fallen, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? The first problem is that Lucifer is a Latin name. So explain to me, please. Did, would they go back and do a little time travel here? Well, did Isaiah jump to the future and realize that, oh, I forgot to put in the right name? 
a fraud, a deception. How did it find its way into a Hebrew manuscript written before there was a Roman language? To find the answer, a scholar at the library of the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati gave this answer. What Hebrew name was Satan given in this chapter of Isaiah, which describes the angel who fell to become the ruler of hell? Ask yourself, because you're going to give a Western answer, and it's the wrong answer. In the original Hebrew text, the 14th chapter of Isaiah is not about a fallen angel. It doesn't have anything to do about an angel but about a fallen Babylonian king who during his lifetime had persecuted the people of Israel. It contains no mention of Satan, either by name or reference. The Hebrew scholar could only speculate that some early Christian scribes writing in the Latin tongue used by the church had decided for themselves that they wanted the story to be about a fallen angel a creature not even mentioned in the original Hebrew text and to whom they gave the name Lucifer, all made up. There is no Lucifer. There is no Satan. Yeah, I know some of you are going back crap crazy at this point. You're about to hit the uh, stop button. Don't. Listen, only a fool walks away from knowledge. What are you, a seeker or a walker? So how did that happen? How did we get a Latin word to go back over 1,300 years and replace the writer? Hmm. How we came to have the name of Lucifer. Are you ready, boys and girls? Here we go. In 382 AD, Pope Damascus commissioned the scholar Jerome to make an official revision of the many Latin versions of the Bible that were floating around in the Catholic Church at the time. There were hundreds, folks, hundreds. Jerome went off to a cave in Bethlehem where he proceeded to make his translation, the Old Testament part of which he supposedly based on the Hebrew text. But in practice, Jerome based his Old Testament very largely on the Greek language, the Septuagint version, which we will refer to as LXX of the Old Testament, which Origen had produced about 140 years earlier while in Caesarea. So Origen had already done the work, wasn't good enough. Jerome had been called by God. And by God, he was going to do the work of God. So by A.D. 405, Jerome had completed his work, which we today know and own as the Latin Vulgate. That's your Bible, folks. For over a thousand years, that's your Bible. The Latin Vulgate. Comprehend what I'm telling you. It is far from a particularly accurate translation of the original text. Rather, it is an interpretation of thought put into automatic, graceful Latin. But it is an interpretation of thought, not a literal translation, and is only good when the translator has a perfect understanding of the thought. He is translating. But if a translator has a flawed understanding of the thoughts he is trying to translate, then his interpretation of thoughts result in a very flawed and misleading translation. For a thousand years, this Vulgate translation was without a rival, and herein lies the problem. The Latin Vulgate translation was the only version of the Bible available to the people of Europe during this period of time. There was no possibility for anyone to compare the Vulgate with any translation or with Hebrew or Greek manuscripts. They didn't exist, folks. They were lost. This is history. This is reality. They did not exist. Jerome understood that Isaiah 14.12 is talking about Satan, where the Hebrew word hallel 
is used for Satan, and Jerome translates this into Latin as Lucifer. Yeah. This is a mistranslation. The Latin word Lucifer is made up from two Latin words. These two words are lux, which equals light, and ferris, to bear or care. Thus, the name Lucifer means, in the Latin language, light bearer or light bringer. But that is not what the Hebrew word halel means. Shortly, we will see exactly what this Hebrew word halel actually does mean. Anyway. As a result of this Latin Vulgate translation, which was virtually the only version of the Bible in use throughout Europe for the next thousand years, Satan popularity became known as Lucifer. This identity for Satan with the name Lucifer was established throughout Europe long before there was ever a translation into the English language. It should be clear that when the first people to translate the Bible into English came along, one of their paradigms was that the name Lucifer applied to Satan. When they came to translate Isaiah 14, 12 into English, they decided that rather than actually translate the Hebrew word Hael, they would simply substitute it with the already well-known Latin name Lucifer. And they could do this because on the surface, this seems to be a reasonable, accurate translation. But it isn't really accurate at all. Do you see how... Us sapiens, we are stupid they, they, and lazy. That's all I can say. History proves that. They were so lazy, they did not bother to do the proper intellectual work. And so they kept it. To summarize thus far, one, it was the Catholic Church which assigned the name Lucifer to Satan. Two, this Latin word is supposedly a translation of the Hebrew noun, hael, used in Isaiah 14, 12. Three, but Lucifer was not an original way of mistranslating the Hebrew word hael. Rendering the Hebrew word hael into Latin as Lucifer was simply copying the precedent set in the Greek language subsequent translation. It never existed. The Greek Septuagint, um, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, <laughs> had translated Isaiah 14, 12 into Greek as isosphos, isosphoros, excuse me, an older way of spelling the Greek word phosphorus. So the reason why Jerome mistranslated Hael as Lucifer is because centuries earlier in the Greek had already mistranslated Hael as phosphorus into Greek. The Greek word phosphorus and the Latin word Lucifer mean absolutely 100% the same thing. Absolutely. There's no ambiguity about it. In their respective languages, both these words mean light bearer or light bringer. They are just as identical as the English word bread for the German word brought, or the English word knife and the German word messer. Phosphorus and Lucifer are completely identical in meaning. So the word Lucifer is a perfect translation into Latin of the Greek word phosphorus. This means that Jerome perfectly translated into Latin the Greek interpretation of Isaiah 14, 12, but Jerome made no attempt to correctly translate the Hebrew word hael into Latin. Jerome simply latched onto the mistranslated Greek version of Isaiah 14 while totally ignoring the ramifications of this way of translating Isaiah 14 into Latin. One of, one of many, many great travesties. And this is the birth of the confusion that reigns supreme today within the Christian religion. It's why it has 3,000, 30,000 schisms. They can't agree as to what to believe on, and with good reason. Now, let's get into the Greek text. In the Greek language, the text of the Old Testament, the word phosphorus, actually is an older version of esphorus, is used seven times. Phosphorus is, in fact, used to translate six different Hebrew words into Greek. Here are the six scriptures. In 1 Samuel 30, 17, the Greek word phosphorus represents the Hebrew word nesheth 
which means twilight. In the Latin Vulgate, this is rendered as Vesper, the Latin Vesper, Vesperus meaning evening. In Job 3.9, the Greek word phosphorus represents the Hebrew word agaphra, which means eyelids, and by extension, dawn. The King James rendering of the dawning of day is rendered into the Jewish translation as the eyelids of the morning. In the Latin Vulgate, this is rendered as aurori. The Latin aurora, aurora, means dawn, or daybreak, or sunrise. In Job 11, 17, the Greek word phosphorus represents the Hebrew word bogar, which means morning, or daybreak. In the Latin Vulgate, this Hebrew word is here rendered as lucifer. No fallen angel. No evil spirit, no enemy of man, daybreak. In Job 38.12 and also in Job 41.18, which is Job 41.10 in the, uh, the, uh, the Latin, excuse me, the Greek, the Greek word phosphorus represents the Hebrew word shakar, which means dawn or dayspring. In the Latin Vulgate, Job 38.12 is rendered as dilucolo. And in Job 41.18, which is also Job 41.9 in the Vulgate, it is rendered as delusion. I think I mispronounced that. The Latin delcolarium or deluski. I'm not a Latin scholar, which means lesser and the break of day and dawn. In Psalms 110.3, the Greek word phosphorus represents the Hebrew word mishkar which means dawn. In the Latin Vulgate, this Hebrew word is rendered by the adjective luciferum, which means light bringer. In Isaiah 14 to 12, the Greek word phosphorus represents the Hebrew word hael. We will see the meaning of this word later, but in the Latin Vulgate, this is rendered as lucifer, which means light bringer. No enemy of God, no enemy of man, doesn't exist. So here is what we have seen. The one Greek word, phosphorus, which specifically means light bearer, has been used in the Greek to translate six different Hebrew words with the following meanings. Twilight for nishphath, ashphath, which means eyelid by extension dawn, boker, which means morning, shakar, which means dawn and day spring, Mishar, which means dawn. Hael has the meaning we'll examine here shortly. Thus, in the Septuagint, all six of these Hebrew words are mistranslated into Greek. The Greek word phosphorus does not mean morning. The Greek word for daybreak and for the dawn, which is used about 26 times in the Septuagint, is orthros. Genesis 19.15, Genesis 32.26. Thus, the above Hebrew words, Afrath and Bogar and Shakar and Mishar, would all have been translated more accurately by the Greek word orthoros than by phosphorus. Translating the Hebrew Nesfith into phosphorus in the Septuagint was clearly a mistake, which even Jerome recognized. And that was why Jerome therefore translated this correctly into Latin as vesper, meaning evening. That leaves the one Hebrew word, hael, that is also mistranslated in the Septuagint as phosphorus. Hael really does not have anything to do with bringing anything. It's simply not about bringing or carrying anything. It is light or be it anything else. Light. Are you getting that? No Lucifer, no Satan, no devil. But this is typical of the extremely poor quality of the Greek translation. Here, they have indiscriminately translated six different Hebrew words with one Greek word, phosphorus. It is the same as the Greek indiscriminately translating 15 different Hebrew words with the one Greek word, hospitasis. The Greek language 
of the Septuagint of the Old Testament is very poor quality and highly unreliable translation. That's the kindest thing that we can say about it. It is so many places where a simple word completely changed the entire context and meaning. However, one thing should be quite clear. The fact that the Septuagint has incorrectly used the Greek word phosphorus to translate five different Hebrew words, right, should tell us that the Greek is also wrong in translating the Hebrew word hael with this Greek word phosphorus. It is not as if hael somehow really means the same as phosphorus and that it is just that the other five words are incorrectly translated. Furthermore, if phosphorus really was a correct translation for one of those five Hebrew words, then it would automatically mean that therefore phosphorus must be a wrong translation for Hael, since Hael has absolutely nothing at all to do with any of the other five Hebrew words. Hael is a different word with a totally different meaning. It has nothing at all to do with mourning. None. What Jerome did with his Vulgate translation, you ready? One, Jerome recognized that the Greek mistranslated 1 Samuel with phosphorus, and so he correctly supplied the word vasphere for his Latin text. Two, Jerome also recognized that the Greek mistranslated Job 3.9 as phosphorus, and so he correctly supplied the word aurore for this verse. Jerome also recognized that the Greek mistranslated Job 38.12 and Job 41.18 as phosphorus, and so he correctly supplied the words dilucolo and dilucoli for these two verses. But Jerome did not recognize the Greek translation of phosphorus. For the Hebrew bogar in Job 11.17, was also mistranslated. And so he stayed with the Greek rendering and supplied the Latin word Lucifer here. This is a mistake. The Hebrew bogar means mourning, and Lucifer does not mean mourning. Jerome also did not recognize that the Greek translation of phosphorus for the Hebrew word mishar in Psalms 110 was also a mistranslation. And so here he also followed the Greek and supplied the Latin adjective luciferum. This is also a mistake. The Hebrew mishar means of dawn, and luciferum mean, does not mean of the dawn. Do you see what happened here? Translation of thought. Six, consider also that of the six different Hebrew words indiscriminately translated into the Greek with the word phosphorus, only the Hebrew word ha'il refers to a specific being. The other five words refer to certain conditions, but ha'il is used to describe an individual. It has nothing to do with the other five words. It is only in Isaiah 14, 12 that this Hebrew word ha'il is ever used. So, there are no other direct references in the Old Testament to help us understand what this word is supposed to mean. With this word, Hael, Jerome, in his Latin translation, blindly followed the flawed Greek translation and therefore simply translated the Greek word phosphorus correctly into Latin as Lucifer. This is also a mistake. Jerome wasn't supposed to translate the Greek word phosphorus. He was supposed to translate the Hebrew word Hael, but that is something Jerome did not do. Furthermore, Jerome simply must have been aware of this mistake because Jerome also used the word Lucifer to refer to a different individual in the New Testament. Jerome used the word Lucifer to refer to two completely different individuals. Did you know that? Thus, Jerome himself clearly knew that his translation of the whole Bible, he had used the word Latin word Lucifer as a name for one individual in an Old Testament and as a reference to a completely different individual in the New Testament. Jerome was obviously clearly aware of this conflict. Thus far, we have seen two places in the Latin Vulgate where the word Lucifer is used in the Old Testament, Job 11 and Isaiah 14. 
but there is also a New Testament occurrence of Lucifer in the Latin Vulgate translation. You see, folks, they didn't even get it right back then, and they knew it. There is no name, person, deity, angel, fallen or otherwise, named Lucifer. It's made up. The other names are made up. The devil, also known as Satan, Beelzebub, Lucifer, Prince of Darkness, Mr. Scratch, Old Nick, is the cloven hoof, pitchfork, wielding, redskinned, horn king of hell, and founder of rock and roll music. He's also a gambler and a businessman, willing to make backs or contracts with you and grant you your wishes and or your musical stardom abilities in exchange for your immortal soul. Really? How ignorant are we? Why Lucifer? Well, here's how it started. In Roman astronomy, Lucifer was the name given to the morning star, the star we now know by another Roman name, Venus. This morning star appears in the heavens just before dawn, heralding the rising sun. The name derives from the Latin term luciferi, bringing or bearer of light. In the Hebrew text, as we have seen, the expression used to describe the Babylonian king before his death is Hael, son of Shihar, which can best be translated as Day Star, son of the dawn. The name invokes the golden glitter of this king. It's the same thing that Louis XIV did. Same thing as King James. It's the same thing as many world leaders today. They think they are gods. Or on a God mission to save God. The scholars authorized by the King James first to translate the Bible into current English did not use the original Hebrew text, but used versions translated largely by Jerome. And over the centuries, a metamorphosis took place. Lucifer, the morning star, became a disobedient angel, cast out of heaven to rule eternally in hell. Theologian, writers, and poets interwove the myth with doctrine of the fall, and in Christian tradition, Lucifer is now the same as Satan, the devil, and ironically, the prince of darkness. He doesn't exist. There is no Lucifer. These people who say, well, I'm a Satanist and I'm a Luciferian, <laughs> all mind coitus, they're role-playing, as most religion is. Role-playing is a requirement for religion. It's all role-playing. Got to have the good guy, and you got to have the bad guy. Otherwise, the religion doesn't work. So Lucifer is nothing more than an ancient Latin name for the morning star and bringer of light that can be confusing for Christians who identify Christ, the Christo himself, as the morning star, a term used as a central theme in many Christian sermons. Jesus, the son of Zeus, refers to himself as the morning star in Revelation 22.16. I, son of Zeus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the light and the morning star. The bright and morning star, excuse me. And so there are those who do not read beyond the King James Version of the Bible who say Lucifer is Satan. So says the word of God. Eh, you're wrong. Thank you for playing. You don't win anything. You are a moron. Bye-bye. Yeah, I said moron. Lucifer does not exist. Totally made up. Now a dose of reality. Let's talk about the biblical God. This is the list of God Yahweh's commands to murder and kill Homo sapiens. We start out with Genesis 6 6, the account of God saying he will murder all life because of his very actions. It was his failing, not Homo sapiens. Genesis 11 6. Because of this intrusion, it resulted in the deaths of millions of Homo sapiens. Genesis 14, murder, killing, is now widespread and condoned by this God. Even Abram was a killer of sapiens. This is also the biggest oversight of theologians, for in this passage, it gives us clues to yet a greater and much longer-lived culture, the Sumerians, even before the garden metaphor. 
Genesis 18, 19, the mass murder of Sodom and Gomorrah by God. Genesis 20, we're studying with a different set of eyes. Genesis 21, God of the Jews is the same God of Islam. Genesis 22, human sacrifice is brought in. Genesis 25, God hates Esau before he was born. Hate, folks. Hate is equated in the, Old, in the New Testament with murder. Exodus 4.24, God met Moses and sought to kill Moses. Exodus 7, Moses is made to be God. That's what it says. Exodus 8.13, the plagues, whereas the death of thousand sapiens took place by the command of the Yahweh. Exodus 14, Yahweh murders more sapiens. Exodus, Exodus 17, the murder of the Amalekic rice. Exodus 20, this God reveals itself to its true nature. Verse 5 and verse 13, you shall not commit murder, be yet. This is the very same God that commanded them to commit murder. Exodus 21, this God believes in slavery. Slavery is condoned. And, uh, and by the way, this God gives many rules concerning slavery. Exodus 22, the approval of murdering of a female. Exodus 24, the initiating of blood. Exodus 29, Animal blood sacrificing is introduced. Exodus 31, the transference is taken place from one species to another lesser species. Exodus 32, 7, how odd that this is not quoted more. God said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought out of Egypt. This Yahweh makes no claim of these people, but implies that Moses is the God. Exodus 32, 14, another reference to the nature of this God. The Lord turned from his evil, which he had thought to do to his people. You see, this God, this Christian God, this Hebrew God, has murder in his heart. He has killed. This is not the loving, nurturing God that we have been taught about. Exodus 32, murder killing is ordered by God and 3,000 souls are killed. Exodus 33, 2, God sends an angel to murder sapiens. In verse 3 through 5, God admits he still might murder all of the Israelites. Listen, folks, if you're sitting contemplating murdering someone, I don't want to be your friend. I'm certainly not going to be worshiping you either. Exodus 34, again, this God states, it is a jealous God. Number 16, verse 21, here again, this God it has murder in its heart. Numbers 25, Baal worship, eight murdered by the high priest of Yahweh, and 24,000 people murdered by the plagues of Yahweh. Exodus 28, more animal blood sacrificing commanded by Yahweh. Exodus 31, God Yahweh gives his command to commit genocide against the Mennonites. And as it is written, go forth and execute the Lord's vengeance. They slew every male. Moses says you have to let the women live. Then Moses gave the command to kill every male and child except every woman who had not slayed with a man. In other words, they, they were physically examined to see if they still had the hymen, then they were then put into slavery as sex slaves. God Yahweh goes against his own sworn oath in Exodus 32. Exodus 35, most revealing about the blood and what it does. I can go on from here. The entire book of Joshua on forward with the other books of the Old Testament that are filled with homo sapiens bloodshed and sacrifice on behalf and ordered of this Hebrew God. In all of the scriptures research, there is not one single reference to Lucifer or Satan ever commanding the killing, genocide, or murder of one single homo sapien. Not one. Now, if you can find for me one scripture where Satan, Lucifer, killed or commanded to kill one human being, please put it in the comment section. For there are many of us who would like to see that proof if it exists, and I'll tell you, it does not. 
From 600 AD to 1900 AD, it is estimated a half a billion homo sapiens have been murdered at the command of the Christian church in the name of their God. This is not made up. This is not exaggerated. This is the reality, folks, of what we built a religion upon, the blood of homo sapiens. There is no Satan or Lucifer. That's an historical fact. Now, you may have a religious belief, but that belief doesn't make it truth. Your beliefs have nothing to do with the actual truth. Now, you can build beliefs from the truth, but still. So I ask, who is the enemy of sapiens? Who has killed more and commanded the killing of our species? You tell me.